I sighed heavily as Ryan pulled me aside, his face etched with concern. "'Jillian, we need to talk,' he said in a hushed tone. "'What's wrong?' I asked, already dreading the answer. He glanced toward the kitchen where his mother, Helen, was bustling around. "'Look at those tea bags on the rack. She reuses them.' I followed his gaze and felt a wave of disgust wash over me. The tea bags were indeed withered and discolored, a testament to Helen's extreme frugality. That's disgusting! This is how your mom welcomes us? Ryan shook his head solemnly. I'm sorry, but you know how she is. I just wanted to warn you before you made the mistake of drinking that tea. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. We had just arrived for our first visit to Ryan's childhood home, and already I was regretting it. Helen's reputation for being overly thrifty, some might say downright cheap, had preceded her, but this was a new level of absurdity. As if on cue, Helen emerged from the kitchen, a wide smile plastered on her face. "'Jillian, dear, I've made us some lovely tea. Come, sit down and make yourself comfortable.' I exchanged a worried glance with Ryan, but he gave me a subtle nod, silently urging me to keep the peace." Swallowing my disgust, I followed Helen into the living room and took a seat on the well-worn couch. Helen bustled about, pouring the tea into chipped mugs. "'I hope you like it,' she said, handing me a cup. "'I always make sure to get my money's worth out of those tea bags.' I forced a smile, gripping the mug tightly. "'Thank you, Helen. It smells... interesting.' Ryan cleared his throat, attempting to steer the conversation in a different direction. "'So, Mom, how have you been?' It's been a while since we last visited. Helen waved a dismissive hand. Oh, you know me, just pinching pennies wherever I can. Speaking of which, Jillian, I hope you don't mind if I ask you to take your shoes off before walking on the carpet. I like to keep things tidy without spending money on expensive cleaners. I fought the urge to roll my eyes, silently wondering what other indignities awaited me during this visit. As I slipped off my shoes, I couldn't help but feel a sense of dread creeping in. If this was just the beginning, how much worse could things get? A few weeks after the tea incident, Ryan and I started planning our wedding. I was excited to finally tie the knot, but Helen's presence loomed like a dark cloud over the joyous occasion. Mom, we're thinking of having the ceremony at the church downtown, Ryan said during one of our planning sessions at Helen's place. Helen pursed her lips disapprovingly. That sounds like an unnecessary expense. Why don't you have it here in the backyard? I can make all the decorations myself from recycled materials. I cringed at the thought of a backyard wedding adorned with repurposed junk. Thank you for the offer, Helen, but we'd prefer something a bit more traditional. Suit yourself, Helen said with a shrug. But don't expect me to contribute financially. I'm on a fixed income, and every penny counts. Ryan shot me an apologetic look, but I was already seething inside. It was one thing for Helen to be frugal with her own money, but to refuse to contribute anything towards her only son's wedding felt like a slap in the face. "'That's fine, Helen,' I said through gritted teeth. "'We'll figure it out ourselves.' Later that evening, as Ryan and I discussed potential venues, I couldn't help but vent my frustrations. "'Can you believe your mother?' I said, my voice rising with each word. Not only does she expect us to have a tacky homemade wedding, but she won't even chip in a dime towards it. Ryan sighed, running a hand through his hair. I know, I know. She's always been like this. I'm sorry, Jillian. I wish there was something I could do. Well, there is something you can do, I said, an idea forming in my mind. You can stand up to her for once. This is our wedding, and we should have it the way we want, without her constant criticism and penny-pinching. Ryan looked torn, his loyalty to his mother clashing with his desire to please me. "'I'll try talking to her again,' he said finally. "'But you know how stubborn she can be.' I nodded, already feeling the seeds of resentment taking root. If Helen wasn't going to cooperate, then I would have to find a way to make her see reason, even if it meant playing hardball. As the weeks went by, the wedding planning only grew more stressful. Helen consistently shot down our ideas— insisting on cheaper alternatives that lacked any semblance of elegance or class. I found myself constantly at odds with her, and Ryan was caught in the middle, desperately trying to keep the peace. One particularly heated argument erupted when Helen suggested I wear an old wedding dress that she would remodel for me. Absolutely not, I shouted, my patience finally snapping. 
This is supposed to be the happiest day of my life, and I refuse to look like a ragamuffin because you're too cheap to let me buy a proper dress. Helen's eyes narrowed dangerously. Watch your tone, young lady. I'm only trying to save you money. Well, we don't need your kind of saving, I spat back. If you're not going to support us, then maybe you shouldn't be involved at all. The words hung heavy in the air, and for a moment, I thought I saw a flicker of hurt in Helen's eyes. But just as quickly, her expression hardened, and she turned her back on me without another word. As the tension in the room threatened to suffocate us, I couldn't help but wonder if I had gone too far. But deep down, I knew this was just the beginning of a long, bitter battle. And I was determined to come out on top, no matter the cost. Tensions reached a boiling point during a pre-wedding family dinner. My parents, Louise and Robert, had come over to Helen's place to discuss the final arrangements. As we gathered around the table, Helen wasted no time in making her opinions known. I still think a backyard wedding would be the most economical choice, she said, her tone smug. I felt my jaw clench, but before I could respond, my mother spoke up. Jill Gillian deserves to have the wedding of her dreams, she said, her speech slightly slurred due to her impairment. Helen's eyes narrowed as she regarded my mother. Well, I'm sure she would if she had the money for it, she said pointedly. My father bristled at the implied insult. What's that supposed to mean? he demanded, his voice taking on a dangerous edge. Helen shrugged unapologetically. I'm just saying, not everyone can afford to splurge on extravagant affairs. I could feel the tension in the room escalating rapidly. Ryan shot me a pleading look, silently begging me to defuse the situation. Mom, that's enough, he said, turning to Helen. We've already discussed our plans, and we're sticking to them. But Helen was relentless, her eyes glinting with a malicious gleam. Well, if you ask me, it's a waste of money. But I suppose that's easy for you to say when you're not the one footing the bill. My father slammed his fist on the table, causing the silverware to rattle. Listen here, you old bat, he snarled, his face flushed with anger. We've worked hard our entire lives to provide for our daughter, and we'll be damned if we let you disrespect us like this. The room fell deathly silent, everyone holding their breath in anticipation of Helen's response. For a moment, I thought she might back down, but then her lips curved into a smug smile. Well, it's no wonder Jillian turned out the way she did, with a foul-mouthed brute like you as her father, she said, her voice dripping with contempt. That was the final straw. My mother burst into tears. And my father leapt to his feet, his face contorted with rage. Ryan quickly stepped between them, his hands raised in a placating gesture. Enough, he shouted, his voice trembling with emotion. Mom, you've gone too far this time. I won't have you insulting Jillian's family like that. Helen scoffed, seemingly unfazed by the chaos she had caused. I'm only speaking the truth, she said dismissively. I watched in stunned silence as my father struggled to regain his composure, his body shaking with barely contained fury. In that moment, I knew that no matter what happened, things would never be the same between our families. As the evening drew to a close, Ryan and I walked my parents to their car in tense silence. Once they had driven away, he turned to me, his eyes filled with a mixture of sadness and frustration. I'm so sorry, Jillian, he said, his voice heavy with remorse. I never thought she would stoop so low. I shook my head, fighting back tears of my own. Don't apologize for her, I said, my voice trembling. This is who she is, a bitter, miserable woman who takes pleasure in tearing others down. Ryan pulled me into a tight embrace, and for a moment I allowed myself to find solace in his warmth. But deep down, I knew that this was only the beginning of a long, bitter battle, one that would test the very limits of our love and resolve. As we stood there, locked in each other's arms, I couldn't help but wonder if there would ever be a way to heal the wounds that Helen had inflicted. But one thing was certain. I would stop at nothing to protect my family, even if it meant going to war with the woman who had given birth to my husband. After the disastrous family dinner, Ryan and I decided to put some distance between us and his mother for a while. We focused on our upcoming wedding, determined not to let Helen's bitterness ruin our special day. A few months later, I gave birth to our beautiful daughter, Lily. Holding her in my arms for the first time, I felt an overwhelming sense of joy and peace wash over me. In that moment, nothing else mattered. 
not the drama with Helen, not the stress of wedding planning, nothing. For a brief period, there was a fragile truce between us and Helen. She seemed genuinely happy to have a granddaughter, and even made an effort to be on her best behavior around us. I dared to hope that perhaps this new addition to our family would be the catalyst for change, bringing us all closer together. But as Lily grew older, Helen's true colors began to show once again. "'Jillian, you really should let me babysit Lily more often,' she said during one of our visits. "'You know how expensive daycare can be.' I bristled at her suggestion, already sensing an ulterior motive. "'Thank you, Helen, but we've got it covered.' She clucked her tongue disapprovingly. "'Suit yourself, but don't come crying to me when you can't afford it any more. As if on cue, my mother entered the room, and Lily's face lit up with delight. "'Gamma Lou!' she exclaimed, using the special name she had given my mother. Helen's expression soured as Lily rushed into my mother's arms, chattering excitedly in the sign language my mother had taught her. "'Really, Jillian, do you think it's wise to encourage that nonsense?' she said, her voice dripping with disdain. I felt my blood boil at her insensitive remark. "'It's not nonsense, Helen,' I snapped. "'It's a way for Lily to communicate with her grandmother.' Helen scoffed dismissively. "'Well, I think it's a waste of time. She'll never get anywhere in life relying on those silly hand gestures.' Before I could respond, Lily turned to Helen, her brow furrowed in confusion. "'Why are you being mean to Gamalou?' she asked, her voice trembling with hurt. Helen's eyes widened in surprise, clearly not expecting Lily to understand her biting words. For a moment, I thought I saw a flicker of remorse in her expression, but it was quickly replaced by her usual haughty demeanor. "'Don't be ridiculous, child,' she said dismissively. "'I was merely stating a fact. Your grandmother would do well to focus on more practical skills.' Lily's lip quivered, and she buried her face in my mother's shoulder, seeking comfort from Helen's cruelty." My heart broke for her, and in that moment I knew that I had to do something to protect her from the toxic influence of her own grandmother. As Helen left the room, I pulled Ryan aside, my hands shaking with barely contained rage. "'This has gone on long enough,' I said, my voice low and urgent. "'Your mother is a poisonous influence, and I won't have her belittling my family any more.' Ryan sighed heavily, his expression weary. "'I know, Jillian. Believe me, I know.' but what can we do? She's my mother, and despite everything, I still love her. I shook my head adamantly. Love or not, this behavior is unacceptable. Either she changes, or we cut her out of our lives for good. Ryan's eyes widened in surprise, but he didn't argue. Deep down, he knew I was right. For Lily's sake, we couldn't allow Helen's toxic presence to continue unchecked. As I held my daughter close, whispering soothing words in her ear, I made a silent vow. No matter what it took— I would protect her from the cruelty of her own grandmother, even if it meant severing ties with Helen forever. Despite the tension between us, Helen was still invited to Ryan and my wedding. A part of me had hoped that the joyous occasion would soften her heart and bring some semblance of peace to our fractured family, but as the day unfolded, it became clear that Helen had no intention of changing her ways. From the moment she arrived, Helen made it a point to critique every aspect of the ceremony and reception. "'You spent how much on those centerpieces?' she whispered incredulously as we made our way to the head table. "'You could have made those yourself with some wild flowers and mason jars.' I gritted my teeth, determined not to let her ruin this special day. "'Thank you for your input, Helen,' I said through a forced smile. "'But we wanted everything to be perfect.' Her eyes narrowed, and I could see the disdain written all over her face. Well, if you ask me, it's all a waste of money, but I suppose that's easy for you to say when you're not the one footing the bill. Ryan shot me a pleading look, silently begging me to let it go. But before I could respond, Helen had already moved on to her next target, the elaborate five-tier wedding cake. You know, back in my day, we made our own cakes, she said loudly, drawing the attention of nearby guests. None of this fancy, overpriced nonsense. I felt my cheeks burning with embarrassment as several heads turned in our direction. Ryan quickly stepped in, trying to defuse the situation. "'Mom, please!' he hissed, his voice strained. "'Not here. Not today.' But Helen was undeterred, her eyes gleaming with a perverse delight at the discomfort she was causing. As the reception wore on, 
her antics only grew more outrageous. When the servers began passing around Hors d'oeuvres, she whipped out a small tup Tupperware container from her purse and started scooping them up like a squirrel hoarding nuts for winter. What? she said defensively when she noticed my stunned expression. These things cost a fortune. I'm just trying to get my money's worth. I wanted to crawl under the table and disappear. Around us, guests were starting to whisper and point, their faces a mixture of amusement and secondhand embarrassment. Ryan's father, Harold, was mortified. Helen, please, he begged, his face flushed with shame. You're making a scene. But Helen was beyond reason, consumed by her own twisted sense of frugality. She continued to stuff her Tupperware container, oblivious to the stares and murmurs surrounding her. As the evening drew to a close, Ryan and I said our goodbyes to our guests, thanking them for sharing in our special day. But as we turned to leave, we were met with a sight that made our hearts sink. Helen standing by the exit, a smug grin on her face and a bulging Tupperware container tucked under her arm. "'What?' she said innocently, catching our horrified stares. I'm just trying to save a few bucks for the happy couple. In that moment, I wanted nothing more than to wrap my hands around her scrawny neck and throttle her. But instead, I took a deep breath and turned to Ryan, my eyes pleading with him to do something, anything, to rein in his mother's outrageous behavior. But Ryan could only shake his head, his expression one of utter defeat. It was clear that on this day, the day that was supposed to be the happiest of our lives, Helen had won. As we walked out into the night, leaving a trail of whispers and judgmental stares in our wake, I felt a cold, hard knot of resentment take root in my heart. This was supposed to be our moment, our chance to celebrate the love and commitment we shared. But once again, Helen had found a way to make it all about her and her twisted obsession with frugality. In that moment, I made a silent vow to myself. One day, somehow, I would make Helen pay for all the pain and humiliation she had caused. It might take years, even decades, but karma has a way of catching up to those who deserve it most. And when it did, I would be there to savor every delicious moment of her downfall. The air was thick with tension as we gathered at the funeral home to say goodbye to Ryan's father, Harold. What should have been a solemn occasion was quickly overshadowed by Helen's usual antics. I can't believe the prices they charge for these things she muttered under her breath as we filed into the viewing room. It's highway robbery, if you ask me. I shot her a warning look, but she seemed utterly oblivious to the inappropriateness of her comments. As we took our seats, I noticed her eyes darting around the room, scanning every surface with a critical gaze. It wasn't until the service began that I realized what she was up to. As the minister spoke, delivering a heartfelt eulogy, Helen reached into her purse and pulled out a small roll of toilet paper. With a furtive glance around, she quickly stuffed it into her pocket. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Even in the face of death, Helen's obsession with frugality knew no bounds. I nudged Ryan, gesturing discreetly towards his mother, but he simply shook his head, too consumed by grief, to deal with her nonsense. After the service, as we gathered in the lobby to greet mourners, Helen's behavior took an even more disturbing turn. Did you see the spread they had set up? She whispered to me, her eyes gleaming with excitement. All those fancy little sandwiches and pastries? You know how much they must have spent on that. Before I could respond, she had already made a beeline for the refreshment table, her purse clutched tightly in her hands. I watched in horror as she began scooping up handfuls of food, stuffing them into her purse with reckless abandon. Helen, what are you doing? I hissed, trying to keep my voice low. This is a funeral, for God's sake. But Helen was too far gone, consumed by her own twisted sense of greed. She continued to plunder the table, oblivious to the shocked stares of the other mourners. It wasn't until Lily, my sweet, innocent daughter, caught sight of her grandmother's actions that the true extent of Helen's depravity was laid bare. Grandma, why are you taking all that food? she asked her voice laced with confusion. Helen froze, her face flushing with embarrassment as she realized she had been caught red-handed. For a moment I thought I saw a flicker of remorse in her eyes, but it was quickly extinguished by her usual defiance. "'Mind your own business, child,' she snapped, her voice dripping with venom. "'I'm just trying to save a few bucks, that's all.' Lily's eyes widened, 
and she took a step back, her small body trembling with fear and hurt. In that moment, something inside me snapped. That's enough, Helen, I snarled, my voice resonating with a fury I had never known before. You've gone too far this time. Helen opened her mouth to protest, but I cut her off with a wave of my hand. No, don't even try to justify this, I said, my words slicing through the tense silence like a knife. You've humiliated us for the last time. Ryan, his face etched with a mix of relief and shame, stepped forward to stand by my side. For once, he didn't try to play the peacemaker. He knew that his mother had crossed a line that could never be uncrossed. As the whispers and stares of the other mourners washed over us, I felt a strange sense of satisfaction settle in my chest. Finally, after years of enduring Helen's cruelty and humiliation, the tables had turned. And as she stood there, her face flushed with embarrassment and her purse stuffed with stolen goods, I knew that this was only the beginning of her downfall. The community that had once turned a blind eye to her eccentricities was now watching, their judgmental eyes scrutinizing her every move, and as word of her actions at the funeral spread, I knew that the same people who had once tolerated her would now turn against her, casting her out like the pariah she truly was. As we left the funeral home, Helen trailing behind us with her head hung in shame, I couldn't help but feel a twisted sense of vindication. The karma that had been building for years had finally been unleashed, and I knew that there would be no escaping its wrath. The aftermath of Helen's shameful behavior at the funeral was swift and merciless. Word of her actions spread like wildfire through our small community, and suddenly she found herself the target of scorn and ridicule from all corners. It started with the whispers and pointed stares whenever she ventured out in public. The neighbors who had once tolerated her eccentricities now regarded her with thinly veiled contempt, their eyes following her every move as if she were a common criminal. Then came the more overt acts of harassment. One morning, Helen awoke to find her front yard littered with toilet paper rolls, a cruel mockery of her theft from the funeral home. Another day, she returned from running errands to find a bag of stale bread left on her doorstep a twisted reminder of her obsession with never letting anything go to waste. At first, Helen tried to brush off these incidents, her pride too strong to admit that she had brought this upon herself. But as the days turned into weeks, and the harassment showed no signs of letting up, her defiant facade began to crack. "'They're treating me like a pariah,' she lamented to Ryan during one of our rare visits. "'All because I was trying to save a few bucks.' I couldn't help but scoff at her self-pity. You brought this on yourself, Helen, I said, my voice devoid of sympathy. Did you really think there wouldn't be consequences for your actions? Helen's eyes narrowed, and for a moment I saw a glimpse of the bitter, spiteful woman she had become. You're enjoying this, aren't you? She spat. You've always hated me, and now you're reveling in my humiliation. I met her gaze unflinchingly, refusing to back down. I don't hate you, Helen. I said, my voice calm and measured. But I won't stand by and let you continue to humiliate and belittle my family. Ryan, caught in the middle as always, tried to play peacemaker. Mom, Jillian's right, he said gently. What you did at Dad's funeral was inexcusable. You need to take responsibility for your actions. But Helen was beyond reason, her mind twisted by years of unchecked selfishness and greed. Take responsibility? She spat. For what? trying to save a few bucks in this overpriced world? I shook my head in disgust, realizing that reasoning with her was a lost cause. As we left her house that day, the weight of her isolation seemed to press down on us like a heavy blanket. In the weeks that followed, the harassment only intensified. Neighbors who had once been content to ignore Helen's quirks now went out of their way to make her life miserable. Insults were hurled, property was vandalized, and more than once, the police had to be called to calm the situation. Through it all, Helen remained stubbornly defiant, refusing to acknowledge the role her own actions had played in her downfall. But I could see the toll it was taking on her. The way her shoulders slumped a little more each day, the haunted look in her eyes as she ventured out into a world that had turned against her. Ryan and I made it clear that she was welcome to come live with us, to escape the constant barrage of harassment and cruelty. But Helen's pride was too strong, and she steadfastly refused our offers, 
choosing instead to remain in her self-imposed exile. As the weeks turned into months, and the harassment showed no signs of abating, I could see the light in Helen's eyes slowly dimming. The once vibrant, if misguided woman was fading away, replaced by a shell of her former self, a bitter, broken soul consumed by the consequences of her own actions. And as I watched her spiral deeper and deeper into despair, a part of me felt a twisted sense of satisfaction. This was the karma she had earned, the price she had to pay for years of cruelty and selfishness. It might have been a harsh lesson, but one that was long overdue. As the dust settled and the chaos of Helen's downfall began to fade, I found myself reflecting on how far our family had come. The turmoil we had endured, while painful, had ultimately brought us closer together, a silver lining in the midst of so much darkness. Ryan and I were expecting our second child, a son this time, and the anticipation of new life filled our hearts with hope and joy. We had made the decision for Ryan to leave his corporate job and take up freelancing, allowing him to be more present for our growing family. Lily, our sweet, precocious daughter, had blossomed into a bright and compassionate young girl. Inspired by her grandmother Louise's resilience and her passion for communication, she had taken a keen interest in sign language and was excelling in her studies. One day, I'm going to be an interpreter, she declared one evening over dinner, her small hands moving fluidly as she signed her words. That way, everyone can understand each other, no matter what. I couldn't help but smile at her earnest determination, so reminiscent of the woman who had instilled this love of language in her. Louise beamed with pride, her eyes shining with unshed tears as she watched her granddaughter's nimble fingers dance through the air. As for Helen, her fate remained shrouded in uncertainty. We had extended an open invitation for her to come and live with us, to escape the constant harassment and isolation she had endured. But her stubbornness and pride had proven too strong, and she had steadfastly refused our offers, choosing instead to remain in her self-imposed exile. Part of me still felt a twinge of sadness at the thought of her suffering, alone and ostracized from the community she had once been a part of. But a larger part of me knew that this was the price she had to pay for her years of cruelty and selfishness. Karma, it seemed, had finally caught up with her. As the months passed and the birth of our son drew nearer, Ryan and I made the decision to start fresh, a clean slate for our growing family. We packed up our belongings and said goodbye to the town that had been the epicenter of so much drama and heartache. On the day we left, I couldn't resist one final visit to Helen's house. Part of me hoped that she would have a change of heart, that she would see the error of her ways and come with us, seeking redemption and a chance to rebuild the relationships she had so carelessly destroyed. But as I approached her front door, a sense of dread settled in the pit of my stomach. The once well-kept yard was overgrown and unkempt, the windows shuttered and dark. It was clear that Helen had retreated even further into her self-imposed exile, cutting herself off from the world that had turned against her. With a heavy heart, I turned and walked away, leaving Helen to the consequences of her own actions. As I climbed into the car and looked back one last time, I couldn't help but feel a sense of closure wash over me. This chapter of our lives was finally coming to an end, and a new, brighter one was just beginning. As we pulled away, the weight of Helen's influence lifted from our shoulders, like a heavy burden we had carried for far too long. In that moment, I made a silent vow, to let go of the bitterness and resentment that had consumed us for so long, and to embrace the future with open arms. Our family had been through the fire, tempered and strengthened by the trials we had faced, and as we embarked on this new journey, I knew that no matter what challenges lay ahead, we would face them together, united by the bonds of love and resilience that had carried us through the darkest of times. The road ahead was uncertain, but one thing was clear. The toxic grip of Helen's influence was finally broken, and we were free to forge our own destiny, unshackled by the weight of her cruelty and selfishness. It was a hard-won victory but one that made the sweetness of our newfound freedom all the more savored.